Okay, everybody. So we're starting. So today we will be talking about cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And the definition of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, it's a type of diffuse interstitial lung disease that affects the distal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, as well as the walls of the alveoli. It's thought that the primary injury starts within the alveolar wall, and on histopathology, we would see intraalveolar buds of granulation tissue that has myofibroblast and connective tissue. We would call it cryptogenic organizing pneumonia as long as there is no cause that is identified or any particular underlying context is found. The mean annual incidence of COP is 1.1 per 100,000 people. <coughs> Pathology is important in COP because it's part of the diagnosis of it after the clinical part. So looking at the slides of COP, it would show characteristics of excessive proliferation of connective tissue and it consists of loose collagen with fibroblast and myofibroblast. Those uh, fibro and myoblast, they are within the alveoli. They could be with or without any intraluminal polyps. The granulation tissue can extend from one alveoli to the another. This way there will be connection between two alveoli and this is called the butterfly pattern. The majority of pathological lesions are within the airspace and they would have chronic inflammation as well. Here we can see the butterfly pattern on, the, on those slides. In the middle one we can see here the butterfly which connects two alveoli together and they would have the granulation tissue within it. Again, the features of CARP under histology, it's basically uh, fi organizing fibrosis within the airspace it's patchy, peribronchial distribution. There is always preservation of lung architecture, which makes it different from other interstitial lung disease, such as UIP or NSIP. <coughs> there is only mild interstitial chronic inflammation. And a non-specific finding, which could be a foamy macrophages. On the other hand, there are pertinent negatives. In order to, since it's cryptogenic, it's not secondary to any other etiology. That's why we need to make sure those findings are not there, such as absence of severe fibrosis, there are no granulomas, there are no eosinophils or neutrophils, and absence of vasculitis, with lack of hyaline membranes and fibrin. Pathogenesis, like the name says, is cryptogenic, it's unknown. However, there were different etiologies and thoughts about the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. One of them is the leak of the plasma proteins to the lumen of the alveoli, which would result in recruitment of the fibroblasts. There has been reports of abnormal regulation of the vascular endothelial growth and the matrix proteinase in association with cup. However, this has been described in other uh, lung diseases such as UIP, so it's really non-specific finding for cup. Also, other uh, suggestions were that microaspiration of gastric secretions in patients with GERD would result in a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And I found one article which did support this theory of uh, GERD and organizing pneumonia. So the purpose of this study, they had a group of patients, they were distributed into patients who have GERD and patients without GERD. There were 44 patients. In the GERD group, they were 20, and in the non-GERD, there were 24 patients. In this table, we can see the comparison of the GERD group with the non-GERD group. They were similar in all characteristics. They had the same treatment of steroids. The total dose of steroids as a cumulative amount of prednisone was pretty much the same. The second line shows that the GERD group received an average of 3,800 milligrams of prednisone as cumulative effect, 
while the non-geared group received 3,700 milligrams of prednisone. So they were pretty much the same, and um, uh, other tactics were the same, except one thing that was different, which is the relapse. The relapse was significantly different. There were 14 patients who had relapse in the geared group, and nine patients in the non-geared group had relapse. This is statistically significant since the p-value is 0.03, which would reflect the severity basically and other stuff. However, if we look at the severe hypoxia, it's pretty much the same in both groups, but there was a difference in relapse, which would uh, mean the severity as well. So here again, They were clinical diagnosis and they were on treatment for them. So patients uh, in the GERD group, they had higher numbers of abnormal findings on chest x-rays and CT scans. And again, as we said, there were more relapses in this group. So as a conclusion, there is evidence that microinhalation of aesthetic secretions would affect organizing pneumonia, would lead to it, and would lead as well to relapses. As we all know, the clinical features of CAP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, it starts in the fifth and the sixth decade, and it's equal in both genders, men and women. It's rarely ever seen in children, and smoking is unlikely to be a precipitating factor. It's only 25% of people with CAP who are smokers, otherwise most of the time they're not, so it's thought that smoking is not a precipitating factor for CAP. As we all know that CAP presentation, uh, they present as if they have pneumonia, they present with shortness of breath, fever, coughing. We get a chest x-ray which shows that they have capacities. Uh, we treat them, they don't respond to antibiotics. But their duration of presentation usually is subacute, could be about two months. Again, they would be treated for pneumonia, and pneumonia is not resolving, and at that time we start thinking of a non-infectious cause and inflammation that's leading to this process. Another pertinent thing in the history is to look for any other causes that would lead to organizing pneumonia, such as any connective tissue disease, and that way this would eliminate the reason for having cough. It would be a secondary organizing pneumonia. Also medications that can uh, result in organizing pneumonia includes amio, different uh, types of chemotherapy and phenytoin. Those would result in a secondary organizing pneumonia. So it's important to exclude any other etiology that would lead to organizing pneumonia. Um, exam, they would have crackers, rarely ever have wheezing. Uh, there's a good portion of people they would have normal uh, lung exam, but again, would need to look for any extra pulmonary uh, manifestations to look for a connective tissue disease. Imaging is an important thing, same as any other patient who comes to clinic with shortness of breath or coughing, we would obtain a chest x ray. Here, this chest x ray shows that the patient has bilateral opacities there in the periphery. And often in patients with cough, those lesions would be migratory. If we repeat this x-ray in a while, they might have a change of location of those opacities. High resolution CAT scan is also very useful in cough to identify the way it looks and the distribution of it. This is a typical presentation. Again, it's bilateral patchy opacities, uh, most of the time in the periphery. The size can be different. It can be only a few centimeters or even it can be a whole lobe. The other CAT scan finding could be uh, a focal opacity and this could be actually deceiving and thought to be a bronchogenic carcinoma. So most of the time those people would end up getting this mass resected 
and on pathology it would show that it's not cancer, it's COVID. And that's the way how it would be diagnosed as a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, not cancer. Also a different atypical way for presentation of COVID is a diffused bilateral infiltrate. Pulmonary function tests, they can have mild to moderate restriction, they can have gas exchange abnormalities, is also common, fusion capacity. Bronchoscopy, the importance of it in CAP is actually to exclude any other etiologies that would cause organizing pneumonia, to exclude secondary causes. So starting with a BAL, it can help to figure out if there's a bleed on those lesions or not, exclude infection, and sometimes, not often, it could help to exclude malignancy as well. Uh, BAL will give us some non-specific findings, including mast cells, foamy macrophages, and the CD4, CD8 ratio would be decreased in those population. But again, this is non-specific finding. Transbronchial biopsy can be useful in the typical cases. If the area that's involved is large, this way it can be helpful. It can show under the logical slides that there's an intraalveolar uh, buds involvement with uh, connective tissue filling in it. However, in atypical cases, uh, TBBX can be not useful as if the lesion is very limited area. The other problem with the transbronchial biopsy is it's difficult to define any coexisting process uh, with the organizing pneumonia. Therefore, often we will need an open lung biopsy, a vas or an open lung biopsy to have tissue and have a clear diagnosis of the uh, underlying etiology and if there is any other coexisting pathology as well. The way we choose which area to biopsy is based on the CAT scan and the location of the findings on the CAT scan. The diagnosis of CARP starts with a clinical presentation. They come with this subacute long history of uh, respiratory symptoms, looks like pneumonia not treated, does not respond to treatment. After that, the workup would include a biopsy to show ontological uh, findings that would involve CARP. At the same time, on those slides and biopsies, we need to exclude any other differential diagnosis on those uh, pathological slides. Talking about the differential diagnosis of CARP and that could be misleading on the CAT scan and the x-rays and the presentation, there are a few uh, other etiologies and disease that can look like CARP, which include simple pneumonia and the way it would present that not responding to antibiotics, that way we start thinking about cough. The other thing is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. However, this diagnosis also needs a clinical plus pathological uh, correlation to get to this diagnosis. Other diagnoses include granulomatous disease, which needs a biopsy to differentiate it, and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Chronic eosinophilic pneumonia responds very well to steroids, and it could actually have a more rapid response than CARP with steroids. Or the other differential would include a diffuse alveolar damage, such as in patients with ARDS. Treatment is different. There's no set guidelines for the treatment. There's different observation, case series, and clinical experience that would suggest how uh, CARP should be treated. However, before treating it, we need to make a decision whether it needs to be treated or not. And this is based on the presentation, the symptoms, and the radiological findings. If there are minimal symptoms, and they are mild, stable, normal PFTs, the x-ray, the CAT scan are not really impressive, we can just wait, not start treatment, and see how they would progress. However, if the symptoms are persistent, they're worsening, then it's strongly suggested to start treatment including steroids, which is the first line of treatment. As long as patients started on steroid treatment, they need to have a regular follow-up. 
with x-rays, PFTs, uh, look for signs of any side effects of steroids. However, if the patient doesn't show improvement within weeks to a few months, then at that time we need to revisit the initial diagnosis of CALP and look for a different diagnosis. Since CALP responds very well to steroids, if it's not responding, it would most likely be a different diagnosis which needs to be identified and treated accordingly. Dosing of steroids, there are different studies which show that CALP can be treated in different ways. However, the dose seems to be ranging between 0.75 to 1.5 mg per kg per day, in addition to solimidrol in the first few days if the disease is very severe, and after that, a decrease in the steroid dose can be done. However, if we're tapering the dose of the steroid, the main concern is relapse. Relapse happens frequently with those patients of CAP can happen up to 60%. And that's why the preferable duration of treatment is usually one year. However, relapses are not associated with any increase in mortality or morbidity. Uh, relapses often happen if there is a high dose of steroids for a very short duration of time. The reason most of the time it's tough because of the side effects of steroids and that's why the patient would decide just to hold off until he has symptoms again, especially that relapses wouldn't cause any increased mortality or morbidity. So some patients would rather be on a low dose or would stop steroids until their symptoms get worse again. Another treatment which would include the cyclotoxic therapy, cyclophosphamide, can be an additive to steroids or uh, an alternative. In addition to that, people with mild to moderate disease, a macrolides may be another option for treatment. However, if we start treatment with macrolides, then uh, if we decide to stop them, they need to be tapered off in order to prevent relapses and recurrences of disease. Uh, the, the way a macrolide works, as we all know, is the anti-inflammatory effect, not the antimicrobial effect. I found one article which discusses relapses in a series of 48 patients. It's a retrospective study. The main purpose of this study was to determine if relapse affects morbidity and mortality. The other thing is to figure out what are the possible risk factors for relapses and to establish whether a standardized therapeutic protocol is beneficial for treatment. So again, it's a retrospective study. Those 48 patients were included in this study based on a histopathologic diagnosis of CARP. They had a clinical presentation. Imaging was also compatible with CARP. Uh, there was absence of any identifiable reason to have organized pneumonia. And those patients were treated with steroids. Those 48 patients were distributed into two groups. The first group, which is the relapse group, it had 28 patients. And there was a subgroup in those relapse group that had multiple relapses, defined as three or more relapses. <coughs> the reason for this subgroup is to have a comparison with the extreme, which is the non-relapse group, the absence group which is abbreviated over here with an NR for a non-relapse group that had 20 patients. So in the relapse group, 15 of those patients had one relapse, 13 patients had two or more relapses, and nine had three or more relapses, which is the multiple relapse group, the MR group. Looking at those patients who had relapses, 16 of them had a relapse within six months, and within one year, 23 patients had first relapse. The mean delay between the onset of treatment of the initial episode and the relapse was about eight to nine months. And on this graph, we can see at the time of diagnosis, 
the probability of number of relapses is less. Uh, the other thing in those people we noticed that the duration of onset of symptoms to the initiation of treatment was shorter in the non-relapse group. However, in the other group, they were had a longer duration of treatment before, before starting treatment. Looking at the relapse group, 68% of those people, they were still actually on steroids at the time of relapse, while 32% they were off steroids. Looking at this graph over here, the majority of those patients were getting less than 20 milligram of prednisone per day when they had the relapse. Only one patient had relapsed and he was on more than 20 milligrams per day, which could be because of non-compliance. However, most of them, they were on a dose of less 20 than 20 milligrams when they had the relapse. The predictors of relapse occurrence There's the delay between the symptom start and the initiation of treatment was significantly longer in the people who had multiple relapses. It was about 22 weeks comparing to the non-relapse group where it was about 11 weeks, which is significantly different. The effects of relapse on morbidity and mortality, they looked at the latest PFTs from when they were not acutely ill and those PFTs were normal in both groups. Plus, on the long-term functional capacity and morbidity, they were similar. In addition to that, there were no deaths in the COP uh, patients or in those patients who had relapses. So it doesn't affect the morbidity or the mortality. The other thing is, uh, in this study also, they did have another uh, idea which is to look for uh, which dose of steroid is more appropriate. So they distributed the patients into two groups, group A and group B. Group A, looking here at this graph, group A had significantly less steroid dosing than group B. Group A, they were treated with a standardized treatment that was proposed to be starting at 0.75 milligrams per kg for four weeks and then taper that dose over the next few months. So when they compared those two groups, group A and B, the dose of steroids and prednisone was significantly less in group A. However, looking at the characteristics of those both groups, group A, they only had 57% relapse, which is the group with the less steroid, Group B, who got more steroid, the relapse was also similar, it was 59%. The clearing of the chest X-ray was also similar in both groups, they were 79%. And given that the relapse rate is the same and they both don't have increased morbidity or mortality, this would uh, justify treating patients with a lower dose of steroids in order to minimize the adverse effects of steroids uh, with lower duration doses of treatment. Another thing, I found this article which discusses four cases that were reported in the literature that would support macrolide use in cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. One of those cases is a 54-year-old female patient. She had multiple comorbidities. She presented with symptoms of coughing, shortness of breath, pneumonia symptoms. She had all the workup, X-ray, CAT scan, and eventually had a diagnosis of cough. At that time, she was started on oxygen plus steroids. However, she had adverse effects of steroids, including hyperglycemia. So the decision was to stop the steroids and start her on macrolide. A month later, she comes in, her symptoms have resolved, she's off oxygen, and she's doing well. So there's an evidence for the macrolide use because of its anti-inflammatory purpose. Looking at the prognosis of COP, yes? Question, what bring the resort to the fact that I use? Should we mycoplasm before the leading parts of post-infection stop? A lot of those small studies are true for people, they never check an IG on the mycoplasm. My experience for the years, some of these cryptogenic ones, it's amazing how many of them have a positive IG on the mycoplasma. Instead of treating for macrolides for four months, I treat them for like you know, five to ten days, and they get better. So if they're in those, when they're trying to get a body, it's important to look and say, 
among those four patients, they were treated first for pneumonia. I'm not sure what they were treated with, but they were treated for pneumonia first, and then they were eventually ended up. But they could have been to, with anything. Yeah. But again, if it's a post-infectious, it's not cryptogenic anymore. Then the well, diagnosis is different. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. So, prognosis. Two-thirds of patients treated with steroids, they get complete recovery. Soon after that, uh, clinical recovery plus the chest x-rays, they improve within weeks to months. Uh, and patients who have consolidations comparing to particular opacities, they have better outcome. Uh, patients with more severe disease, uh, they have a higher potential for subsequent relapses. And the other important thing is it's important to start treatment as soon as CARP is recognized in order to decrease the number of relapses.